Yeah. 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 Yeah.
with it, including flight check. It just it, it's the more that we delay it, the, the now we're December if it's four months. So right, right, and that's one of the reasons why we're proposing this to the board is because mm -hmm. uh, I think that if we, we hold on any longer, it's 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 going to be down for an extended period of time. So to me, I mean, happies, it's they're hard to come by. I mean, there's thousands of airport in the country, and it's hard to get peppy flights. That's kind of unusual to me, but you're doing the best you can, so. Mm -hmm. All right, and what's your point? I, I mean, we're talking, they'll be down for like eight months. And if you have thousands of airports in this country, it's not due to lack of, it's, it's a combination of things, right? They have to custom make them. Okay. And then there's certification requirements mm -hmm. that is yeah. time consuming, is my understanding, right? Yeah, Absolutely. the lead time on oh, getting the pappies just on site is yeah. 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's it's three months just to get the pappies here and then the time for them to get them installed yeah. and do the flight check. Okay. Which they could be installed, but we can't turn them on until they've been Certified. Absolutely. Now, now that there's an instrument approach, a published instrument approach to zero, we have to go that mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. I second it. Great. All those in favor of approving, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Public comment. Oh. I, tell me, there's no public comment, Carrie. <laughs> yeah. There's no public comment. There's really no public comment. What's up, Carrie? Okay. <laughs> All those opposed. Nobody posed. First amendment to a contract for the provision of aircraft rescue and firefighting services. Um, Madam Chairman and members of the board, uh, this is a proposal that uh, has been years in the making um, and uh, uh, everything's starting to come into fruition. We did budget this year to, uh, to extend the hours of ARF coverage to a 24 hour a day, seven day a week. Uh, schedule. Um, there's multiple reasons why I actually had to do some hunting cold talk this morning uh, just to get some background on this because in my world in operations it makes total sense if the airport can afford to have firefighting services um, for uh, all operations at any time of the day it makes sense but then I did have a good conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Barentine uh, yesterday and so I wanted to kind of back that up and explain more about why why it's so impactful for the airport. Um, the the uh, um, it's an effort to provide better fire and emergency services to our tenants on the airfield, and that includes everybody. For example, general aviation. We do know that general aviation community has a tendency to fly usually when they get off of work, um, and then also on the weekends. During those times, we don't have a dedicated fire service on the airport to respond to any incidents or accidents, nor do we have an operations person for that matter. Um, the, um, the, the response time for ARF is typically three minutes. And the reason why, and I'm sorry to have to be so grim about this, but the reason why there's a three minute expectation for commercial air service, and it bleeds over over to any airport that has ARF services, after three minutes, an aircraft fire is not survival, period, in the story. So there's a three minute response time. Uh, right now, as, as it stands right now, it's uh, Kern County does a great job with their fire service coverage and protection. But they cover a huge swath of Kern County um, out of here in Mojave. Um, Paul ambulance service is in the same in the same uh, uh, arena. They, if we call for an ambulance, depending on where they're at, uh, it could be five minutes, it could be 50 minutes. So we would have, what we're proposing is that during, um, from 5 p.m. to 7 a.m., we have one armed firefighter on duty covering the airport, assisting us with providing uh, lighting inspections, um, uh, wildlife response, uh, any kind of emergency response in the airfield during those times, including disabled aircraft to assist and coordinate some of that, those efforts. Um, and then uh, uh, there uh, would obviously be, uh, we, we do have rocket engine test, motor testing that occurs uh, frequently. ABL has been a great example of, of having to, to dip into the late evening hours. So this proposal would basically allow, um, provide better coverage for our GA pilots that are flying during off hours. It would um, allow for better, uh, more uh, testing time for our rocket test facilities. It would also, uh, uh, it would also help us out with making the airport more attractive 
for certain types of operations that we do generate uh, uh, revenues, for example, hot fuels. Um, there have been requests from, from the Navy to come in on weekends or in, in our off hours. We've got them trained now to go, okay, well, we're not going to check in as much because we know that they're not available. But uh, if, if having an our firefighter on duty during the weekends, we can readily uh, do a hot field, no problem. Um, it is also a great marketing tool. Um, once, if we approve, we would change in our AFD uh, that we do have our services available 24-7 which uh, would uh, entertain, entertains more um, operations that require ARF standby for them to do, to, to do their operations. Some of our own tenants here require ARF standby even when they're, they're just doing a regular flight. For example, tonight, Virgin Orbit is going to be uh, performing a flight check and they did request ARF standby. Um, there's also a couple of other things that, uh, that kind of go into the, be the benefit of it, but uh, one, one that was brought up by ProTech is there is a challenge to recruit qualified firefighters in this area. Um, by allowing a 24 hour day, seven day a week schedule, they can modify the schedule to where we have a four, uh, uh, our firefighter that, that's on duty for 48 hours straight, and then is off for three days. So we can have some of a, uh, we can have a, a, a broader um, net, cast a broader net of interested people that want to work at the airport that don't want to have to make that commute time back and forth constantly. It just, it, it's, um, it makes sense, um, obviously on paper. Um, and uh, so, I mean, based on, on some of those explanations, uh, the, the staff does recommend uh, that we entertain uh, the amendment with Protect Fire Services to provide 24 seven coverage. And just as a reminder, we did budget for this uh, this year. So what's the financial impact of this? Uh, since we did consider this, uh, Todd had been working on this prior to leaving, so when we did the initial budget, we did budget for the idea of going to 24-7. No, but in other words, a year that we haven't had it versus a year that we do have it, what's the difference in financial um, it, two, it was an increase of $250,000 for the year to add that additional support. That's all. Um, That's really surprisingly low. Yeah. Well, it's one person. That's yeah. one person. But there's 16 hours they have yeah. to serve, so it'd be two persons per night. Yeah. Quite a million bucks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what now, there is one with. loss of revenue. I don't know if you guys thought about this, but usually after our services, we bill whoever requires it. And obviously, we won't be billing whoever requires it. Uh, that would be up to the board, or that we could not still. Not necessarily. Okay. Can we hear my next question? Good. Okay. okay. Which is, uh, that all sounds great, but what is. You know, if you're trying to fight an incident with a 747 with a cleft gear or something, is one guy adequate to respond to that, or or, or a rocket incident out of the test site? So really, those clients are still going to have to pay OT for additional support. Is that not true? Or? Good question. No, it's it's an excellent question. Uh -huh. um, so basically, um, I don't know if you guys know much about this, but our trucks um, are designed for single person operation. The NFPA does not support that. And a lot of, uh, con of, of uh, fire departments do not support that because they, they go by the traditional rule of three in, three out. So um, can we provide coverage for like a 747 uh, with a PT 3000? Um, yeah, maybe. We might have to call in another uh, another person to, to man another vehicle just just to, um, for safety considerations. But a, a, an ARF truck for initial response is really all about, at the end of the day, knocking down the fire, creating an exit route, and then uh, stabilizing the situation so we can have uh, backup or mutual aid uh, entities arrive on scene. So it can be done. There will be instances where we might need to consider uh, bringing in an additional uh, uh, employee to cover for certain types of operations, which might require more than one fire truck. So how is that determined between the client and part as far as what's adequate coverage? So what we've done historically is if the client's going to run a special operation, they will have an agreement with the airport, and that agreement will specify the type of coverage they need. And so if there's extra firefighter coverage, that requirement plus the cost is included in that agreement. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. So, Lynn, what do we call those agreements? Special operations agreement, we do, we 
And we can continue to do that. Now, if someone's landing at night and something goes wrong, we don't charge them. It's mm -hmm. if one of our tenants is doing a test or a special operation that we have those type of agreements where we charge extra. Well, there I can agree because there's been several situations where a blowout on the freezer or something and whatever gear up and they're stranded. And having somebody here that understands logistics of what to do would be huge, especially for that. And people involved. Yes, yeah, so what I'm hearing is this isn't a huge impact to uh, the loss of revenue. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I think it's based on how I'm hoping it's going to be justified because it'll encourage more testing, more jobs, more, and somehow in the end it'll. Yeah, and we did budget actually in our operating expense, so because we did have the increase in revenue that we budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's coming out of our operating to come in at night or on the weekends. Is there any collateral support required to make that a comprehensive earth package on off hour? Like, there's no tower, there's no, I mean, is there going to be additional required support from Unicom type thing? Like, to help with the response? Um, I wouldn't I say with, with, at this stage, or I think that at this stage, we're, we're just making a decision on on um, having that, that individual, that singular our firefighter on duty. Um, we do chart, we do have a um, ability to, to, if somebody requests, we, hey, we need to have the tower open. Like there are some operators that- I get that, but I meant just the default, like for that to be effective, is there any other change besides that person being on duty? In other words, oh, okay. Um, does it require a coordinator, even if it's not tower, someone to help monitor Unicom, whatever? Or I mean, how do you know the incident happened? I don't know. Is that something? Is that the responsibility of the ARF guy now? Or? Well, because in our off hours right now, we do have somebody that that's on duty with security that works in the, the we call it Unicom, but monitors the Unicom frequency. If they get a notification from a pilot that, hey, something happens, that's the central focal point that picks up and calls 911 and then notifies um, uh, ARF to respond, okay? Um, so the reason why we call 911 is because a singular ARF firefighter will need to have mutual aid potentially, and we want to have mutual aid rolling at least, even though they might be a, I don't know, Rosemond. Rosemond. They, they, they do Rosemond as well here in the morning, so. So we, we get the, the backup troops at least dispatch or know that we need their assistance. But uh, this this individual is purely for mitigation, um, putting out the fire initially, knocking down, um, providing uh, medical assistance uh, in the interim until we can get the ambulance service to, to come. I don't know if you guys know this or not, each one of our firefighters is EMT certified. So um, it's, it, it's a good um, like stopgap until we can get everybody else there. Question I have then, um, the tenants that pay for this after hours coverage, I mean, that's a loss of revenue. About how much would that be? I mean, compared to the quarter million dollar that it'll cost, we're losing revenue from previous rocket firings and that at night. I'm curious what that delta would be then. You know? Yeah, I don't have that offhand, but it's not a quarter of a million dollars, okay. um, the, what we've been charging for them after hours. There was a brief time that they actually were testing with not having fire support there. And then that's when we ran into situations where something would happen and they didn't have the proper support there. Mm -hmm. So this kind of would allow them to test. And normally we just have one person. Outside. We may have to adjust it a little bit with some experience. Yeah. Um, so isn't this um, solved by what we were just talking about with the agreement yeah, for okay. any special events? Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. There'll be somebody here after hours to know that those activities are happening. Okay, so there weren't agreements in place. Okay, yeah. so co communication yeah. wasn't really yeah. happening like we would have hoped yeah. previously. Any other questions? Okay, so you need us to approve the uh, amendment as presented then? Is that the uh, request? Yes. Okay. Well, any members of the public wish to actually chime in? Give the valuable, valuable opinion, please. No, 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 no. Okay. 
Oh, swing your emotion. Swing. Alright, give me a second. A second. Alright. All those in favor of uh, amending the contract for uh, the description that we were just discussing, uh, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Nobody opposed. And that's it for the action items. A lot of the reports. Let's see what we got for us. Um, Madam Chairman, members of the board, um, I do have a little bit of a lengthy list. It's a, um, I do have um, a gentleman with a Concentric that's here to, to um, do a brief presentation on a proposal that, uh, that, we're, uh, that we've uh, requested. Uh, I think he has some handouts that he's already uh, provided for you guys. But uh, there's also, a, a Todd did leave me a, um, a series of questions that I, that I need to ask Concentric to, to kind of tease out some of the information that we need from uh, the proposal and, and present to the board. Brian, Brian I'm, I'm sorry, I was drawing a blank. Uh, this is Brian with Concentric, um, mm -hmm. and he has a brief presentation. Yeah, I'm gonna fill in here. Thank you, everybody. And it works, is it okay if I- Yep, no, you can do that, yep. Yeah. I like to turn the mic this way. Perfect. Thank you for having me here. Um, yep. Strong button, straight on. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, my name is Brian Curtis. I'm with uh, Concentric Power. Um, and what I'd uh, like to talk about to today is a proposal that we've been working on, and, and actually it's really more of a design basis and uh, commercial terms for a microgrid uh, for, uh, for the airport. Um, a little bit of history on, on the project. Uh, we've been engaged um, down here for going on two years now. With a couple different touch points in terms of the initial introduction, it turns out um, I knew Karina, when the picture on the wall, um, from business school. She was a couple years behind me at MIT, um, and we both ran the, uh, the entrepreneurship competition. But we were uh, back at school, and so I was on the board there, and she was the, the organizer. So um, I knew, I've known Karina for uh, um, 20 years, the kind of thing. Um, and then also, just uh, incidentally, uh, just by coincidence, actually, uh, Matt Nelson was. Predecessor, um, I grew up in up in Slates, which is over base. Uh, so concentric, uh, we're focused on the central coast. So what we do is uh, develop microgrid projects. Um, we'll get into what that means in general, but also specifically for the application here. But uh, but generally, what it means is it's providing uh, energy infrastructure for um, and what we focus on is is industrial applications. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is ultimately an industrial park uh, with, with energy needs current and future. Um, so the, the genesis of the idea here was um, the, the power infrastructure uh, here is, I would say, sufficient, but maybe barely sufficient for existing tenants. Um, and to the extent that we've got additional uh, for lack of a better term, economic development happening, um, where there's new tenants that are evaluating a hobby versus other locations, um, or, or existing tenants expanding. Um, one of the bottlenecks is, is power and being able to, to, to deliver the power. And we'll talk a little bit about the different types of, of loads that you, you have in the park here. If it's, it's, you've got a good amount of load diversity, you could say, in engineering speak. Um, and what that really means is there's lots of different kinds of, of power needs uh, depending on different applications which we'll talk about. Um, so just uh, a little bit about concentric, or actually before we get into that, just uh, agenda-wise, um, what I'll, I'll talk through is uh, basically executive summary on our findings over the last um, six to eight months. Um, we'll talk about a little bit of load, configuration, the economics, and then some of the other uh, important considerations. Uh, that's, that's what I'm really digging into is regulatory, environmental, uh, music side of things, and, and utility interconnections, um, and all the stuff that you, you have to do to have this actual work. Um, so that's the, the agenda for today. Also, in terms of just uh, style of presentation here, um, please interrupt anytime and ask questions. We can be 
fluid. I can jump around in the presentation and, and look, you know, if something comes to mind, don't hesitate to, to shout out and we can, we can talk about it. Um, also, in terms of um, timing or time to present, I could talk all day. I'm going to try to keep it brief, um, but I'm happy to stay as long as we need to. So, either cut me off or I'm going to go longer on any topic you want to go. Um, so in terms of concentric power, like I said, we're, we're developing microgrids um, for, for industrial applications. Uh, a lot of our, our routes come from ag industrial up north, um, and I'll, I'll go quickly through some reference projects that we have, but uh, we've got experience uh, developing solar batteries and engines and the distribution uh, that goes with that. So distribution in this context um, can include things like substation and transformers and poles and wires and things like that. So that's that's what we do. Our, our philosophy is generally to be technology advantaged and to provide a, a whole a whole solution for, for customers. And what I mean by that is um, in our view, especially for industrial applications, just to have one of the components is only a partial solution. So I think it's great that a lot of people have put solar on the rooftops, and I totally encourage as much of that as, as we can across all sectors. Um, but it only gets you part of the way there. Uh, similarly, with like, the generation is, is common in industrial applications. That's a, a, a good solution as well, but only a partial solution. So the way we look at it is we're looking at developing holistically the infrastructure that, that provides uh, not just sustainable energy, but um, but also firm, dispatchable, and and resilient energy, um, and, and that's, that's, that's an important factor for for industrial applications where you can actually run in island mode um, temporarily or indefinitely. Actually, um, so that's part of our design philosophy. Island mode. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So island mode meaning um, if the greater grid goes down. You can isolate yourself and, and be an island and run. I kind of assume that. I just went. yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, and, and there's a couple different uh, versions of that where in some in some instances, which is kind of the end game, that I think is the right solution here, is you get interconnected so that you're part of the larger grid, but you also have the ability to isolate yourself from it if you need to. Um, the other aspect of that is. Um, being able to run in island mode without interconnection also allows you to develop uh, infrastructure and and the power that you, you might need on your own timeline, independent of, of the grid. And so, if you guys have been involved with, with power projects, you'll know that uh, the interconnection, the timeline, the cost associated with, with the grid can be really unpredictable, and in some cases, really extended. And that's happening, uh, unfortunately, all too often here in California. Um, and, and I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Um, as, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, some of the, the current legislation Biden actually signed today uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act um, is largely an energy bill. Um, and that's going to encourage, it's, it's good, uh, it's good for energy projects, but it's also going to encourage a lot more of them. So the, the whole system is going to be pretty overwhelmed for a few years, um, which is, in the, end, the end game is going to be a good outcome, I think, for the country. Uh, but in the meantime, it's going to be just a lot of a lot of activity that we're going to have to uh, we collectively. What, what do you mean by overwhelming? In what system? Yes, sorry, yeah, so the, um, what I'm talking about here is um, interconnection, and the, so the conventional wisdom is that uh, if you develop a solar project or a battery project just by itself, you've got to interconnect to either uh, SoCal Edison, PPD, you're doing it at a higher voltage, which is sometimes not the case for larger projects, that would be the case here. The interconnection process is through California Independent System Operator, or CAISO. Um, and so they've got a very prescribed, uh, uh, basically, process that you have to go through to get interconnected. And as an example, last year, before the current legislation, uh, they run what's called a cluster study. And so they, they look at all the big projects that are happening as holistically so they know what grid upgrades we need to make. We're talking a little bit ahead of the 
committing um, is look at electrification of transportation and, and all the renewables coming online. The grid itself is going to be pretty massive overhauls. And being able to interconnect to that grid and be part of that cluster process is, has already seen a lot of delays. I think that's even worse. So the system being overwhelmed is a process. Um, so it's, it's interrelated. Um, but going back to the question on island mode, uh, if you can operate in island mode reliably with the right asset mix, uh, you can you can sort of decouple yourself from that process where it might take five years to get a project interconnected and you can actually get up and running. So if you have a tenant that's coming in and saying, hey, I, I need power that you know, performs like this, you can you can serve that to them. And, uh, that's a good competitive advantage for you guys trying to track the um, Yeah, so that's a little bit about concentric. I'll go really fast through just some reference projects. Um, the first one I'll, I'll spend a, a couple minutes on because it has a lot of similarities um, to what we're doing here. Um, City of Gonzales up north um, is an industrial park, it's, it's an ag industrial park. Um, but size, size wise and, and load wise and, and some of the regulatory aspects um, are there's some commonalities with what we're talking about here. This is a project that we have in development right now. And just to kind of paint a picture, it's an industrial park, it's about a third built out. Um, so the, the first phase of the micro grid we built for them is going to serve the existing <laughs> As you can see, these are refrigerated warehouses, basically food processing plants. Um, and so we're building 10 megawatts of uh, solar, I'll talk about the next slide, 10 megawatts, four hour duration of batteries, and 10 megawatts of natural gas engines. Um, and that'll be sufficient for the initial existing loads, and then we'll have provisions to be able to um, expand that um, as, as the park grows out and we'll uh, get pretty significant size. Like you can see in this particular case, with wind and solar that already exists and we're integrating with, with all of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about you know, the regulatory side of it uh, as well, but um, in the case of Gonzales, um, they stood up a municipal utility, the Boston Municipal Electric Utility, which was a process in itself. The really interesting thing about Mojave is as a special airport district, we, we dug into this is you can actually operate as a, effectively as a municipal utility or public utility by nature of being a special uh, a special district. Um, so you're already one step ahead of a project like this. So, yeah, to pause right yeah. there, uh, I know we've, it's been a minute since we discussed this, but being able to actually function as a utility, is that something we're really glad to do? Uh, there is precedent for it, yes. Okay. And other agencies who have done the similar thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so SoCal Edison provides our electricity, correct? Mm -hmm. And so you previously dealt with SoCal and they did that because PG&E has had a lot of problems, as you probably know about brownouts and blackouts and stuff. Not as bad as Edison, but yeah. And the California government, I mean, a lot of times people put solar panels on their houses and they can't sell their electricity back to the government. So, right. It's just a lot of government and utilities are kind of in the way for a lot of people right now. There's, yeah, there's, and there's a lot of nuance to, to all of that. So part of what you're alluding to there is uh, net metering. So being able to mm -hmm. put, put power back on the grid, mm -hmm. get paid for it or credit for it. Right. And there's a few different ways to structure that for residential and commercial. Mm -hmm. It's largely net metering. So you get a credit for it and you show up at the end of the year. In the case of uh, a municipal utility or a public utility, which you guys can qualify as, it, 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 you can actually structure it really however you like, uh, which gives you some some maneuverability in terms of how you how you deal with it. So going back to the Gonzales project, because there's already solar and wind and cogen within the industrial park, we're having to, and when I say we, really the city is putting together their own set of tariffs and rules of their own to, to handle that. Um, so being able to operate the public utility actually gives you get a lot more flexibility. The other interesting thing that we learned in the process of the Gonzales project is uh, it's in BGD territory is the conversation between 
two utilities is very different than between utility and just a rate payer. Um, so if you're putting in solar panels, that's going to be you know, just a utility to rate payer kind of conversation. If it's a model air and spaceport, it's a special district property and a public utility, it's a bilateral negotiation that gives you a lot more room to negotiate with that. That's a good thing from your perspective. Yeah. Um, sure. I, I skipped ahead um, just to what we're, we're talking about it. Um, the, the precedent that, that we talked through um, is at Monterey Airport. Um, they, um, they actually just did it by resolution, uh, basically saying, hey, we're, we're a special airport district, and uh, as defined by law, the property is public utility. It was, it was as simple as that. Um, yeah, they're. <coughs> They were a little more liberal in their interpretation of the law than I am, but generally it has been done before. Okay. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was going to say. So Scott and I have talked about it there. It's, there's probably some detail to dig into there to make sure you guys are comfortable with it um, in, in the context here. And it's also a bit more going as big as what we're talking about here. So uh, probably very, very a lot of attention. Um, but in any case, uh, very impressive. So, so that's uh, on the regulatory side of things. So, just to finish the quick thought here on Gonzalez, what we're doing here. Um, so, the slide I was showing before the industrial park is, is up here. The building solar um, down by the West Washington plant. And so, we're, we're co locating solar with that. So, there's some some similarities uh, that we get into the, the layout that we talked we're talking about here where we've got solar uh, and some space that's allocated on the, the north end of that. The solar canopy is it like carport type thing? Or? In this particular case, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's basically um, the waste larger plants. Once the water gets treated in this particular case, uh, it percolates back down into the water table. So we're putting canopies up above those perp ponds. Um, there are a couple of spots that are also ground now. Um, the case here, um, what we're proposing is just doing ground now because we've got the space. It's significantly cheaper to, to do just straight ground now instead of, in fact, uh, the, the structure for power ports is one steel. Uh, so that's really, really what it comes down to. But if you've got the space, the cost is lower, you can do just straight conventional ground now, which is what you see all around that. Yeah, there's some schools down in Lancaster that they have carports. Yeah. For all the staff and solar. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so that's, like that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, just thinking out loud here, yeah. you know, we have power. Yeah. So one of my questions to you is going to be what's, what's in it for concentric? But yeah. before that, just to make a statement that sure. what's in it for us? Yeah. Um, and one of the things would be, you know, if there was some symbiosis like shaded structure or something like that, we can get into that later. But sure. Yeah. Okay. You know, justification more than just, you know, a profit motive or some stability, you know, energy stability, which I'm not sure we have a huge problem with yet. Yeah, probably. And I can hit all those. Um, yeah, and, and maybe just to hit the, the highest level on that. Um, is the kind of the catalyst for starting the conversation to begin with was really more about insurance power. And, uh, there's a couple of specific tenants that, uh, or potential tenants, I should say, um, namely um, CalSpan and SpaceLink, which are two very different um, electric load types. Um, what we started talking about is how if those tenants were to show up, how do we meet me? You guys, uh, how do we how do we serve them power and bring them through? Demonstrate to them that, that, that you have the infrastructure that they need to, to do what they need to do. So that was kind of the impetus of it. Uh, you're right, the existing power is working today. Um, well, not working, but it's not terrible either. Um, but there's also, um, and we'll get into this, is um, as you look at sort of the, the test uh, testing facilities that are. A lot of them are running diesel generators. Um, so part of the part of the vision here is to provide power through the through the whole plant. 
not just part of the uh, goal. So, yeah. so I just kind of what got the conversation started. Um, I'll go quickly through the. I won't spend any time. We can come back to them if you, if you need to. But um, we did some we did a project we built a, a ranch scale microgrid, ten thousand acre ranch. Um, um, built the solar as phase one, and now we're in the process of uh, doing the design work for uh, battery and further distribution. Um, this is a, a cogen. Uh, artist couple working here with um, the engine unit here, um, the solar and wind party there. Um, so we integrate with that. So there's you know, technology. Is this your first bridge? Uh, no, this is uh, Taylor Farm. Yeah, King City, I saw. Yeah, yeah, the previous one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of what we've done so far is. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, South South Mar 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 yeah. yeah, Southeast. So. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, how the line runs through. Interestingly, on this project, we had to contend with um, a whole land review of PGE where we have to deal with the, the freeway, the river, railroad, um, all that kind of stuff. Environments. Yeah, in this particular case, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, there was a kit fox, it was the, uh, the species that people were mm -hmm. paying attention to. Turned out there weren't any, but um, every location's got environmental stuff to, to mm -hmm. uh, This This one's a uh, in Gonzales, actually, so we, we've been operating in the, in the industrial part of this kind of reverse angle on uh, the bigger market that we're building around it now. Um, but this is a fresh vegetable processing plant. It's about 250,000 square feet and it's 34 degrees inside, uh, so that's a big energy consumer. And it's the same project. And this is another one a little bit further north. Um, similar in this particular case, though, um, we added the layer of the microgrid distribution. So there's um, electrical rooms and transformers and being able to switch gear um, that we put in place to, to facilitate the, uh, the integration here. And then, um, so I'll pause there for a second. Any questions about concentric generally? And then we can jump into this one. Um, okay, so, so basically uh, the process we went through um, in the discussion was uh, evaluating existing loads, uh, forecasting some future loads, and putting together a configuration that would serve those loads uh, according to the specs that uh, we talked through with their team in terms of um, what are the what are the goals, so kind of in terms of what's in it for you guys. Um, the idea is to be at least a little bit cheaper than the grid, uh, quite a bit cheaper than the grid, but, um, but also um, being able to provide power for new new development that comes in. So uh, we can get into a ton of detail, but as I understand, um, there are some areas here for potentially the cow spans, the example we've got coming back to is a sort of hypersonic wind tunnel that's got to you know, turn those things on. It's got to Big energy load, um, space link, which is in the park here, additional hangars and operations over on this side. And so the idea is to be able to connect um, not just existing loads, but also new loads, some of which are expected to be really significant, as well as um, picking up uh, some of the operations out here. And in, in the course of doing that, also taking advantage of some of the land that's available. <laughs> Um, so we talked about solar up top um, and being able to create a loop. Um, there's uh, a couple different versions of this if we went through it, but uh, nominally we were thinking to put the engines and the batteries kind of over in this corner. Um, theoretically they could be anywhere um, on the loop, but uh, this, this had good access uh, in general for operations and maintenance. Um, this is the natural gas line that runs through. Uh, um, so the initial sizing uh, was based on uh, basically two loads, uh, the, the existing load in all of the existing stuff that's connected, uh, plus space link. Um, so I know there's some work to do. Uh, my, my understanding is that, uh, that they are likely coming, but it's but obviously they're not built yet. 
Um, so we're then setting that load and sizing it correctly with another level of engineering will do that. Can can you control uh, price stability? I mean, it seems like I have sold for quite a few years and it just keep going up. Yeah. And as far as your type of system, do you have more control over the price stability? So uh, just to clarify the question, uh, price stability means yeah, the, yeah, you do. Um, so if you think about it, um, as a as a public utility, um, basically the, the rates that you set to the end users, that's that's at your, dis at your discretion, depending on how you want to manage it. Um, you know, it could be you decide to manage it through this process, you know, um, board meetings, and, and you know, let the tenants have a say in that, or you can just dictate it to them. But it's really you can you can determine how you want to set those rates. Uh, but but you're able to have some control over future rate increases on, on your end. Yeah. Who's, who's your end? You mean cost or do you mean rates? Well, cost equals rates at some point. <laughs> well, well, the pricing on one side and cost on the other side. Okay, um, cost. But yeah, so um, the, the short answer is absolutely. So if you look at the, the energy mix here, uh, and this is intentional. Is it's largely this is largely a solar plus batteries project. Um, and there's engines there to provide firm power when you need it on the short winter days and, and things like that. You want to have that extra reliability. But um, if you look at the cost of solar. It's largely the cost of capital. And so once you build the thing and set your rates uh, based on your cost. It's, it's basically set. So uh, just to jump ahead a little bit to commercial structure, um, what we're proposing here is very similar to what, we, what we're doing for Gonzales, which is why I wanted to talk about that project, where um, basically we, Concentric, uh, will own and operate all the assets. So we'll bring, the, we'll bring the capital, we'll build the system, and we'll sell you the, the public utility power that's the wholesale rate. And then, um, and then you can resell it to each of your tenants uh, with the retail rate. Um, so, in other words, there's a a single sort of wholesale relationship between us. I think that's what I was missing. Though. Yeah. So there's a wholesale relationship between us, and we'll negotiate that up front now. Um, and then, uh, and there's the retail relationship yeah. with each of the each of the users. So we can help you manage that. But it's almost an example again, where uh, even though they're the retailer or reseller there, um, we're actually going to be contracting with them, or they're contracting with us to do a lot of that work to manage that. Um, so it's kind of a just a commercial structure discussion. Um, how much uh, how much gas would you use to provide it? I mean, you said solar, like almost all of it, or it's all gonna, of it? It's going to be um, uh, between 80 and 90 percent solar. And the other it's gas? The rest of the gas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, on that point, um, to, to your question of cost, uh, the the natural gas commodity price mm -hmm. is outside of our budget control. Um, so that there's going to be a little bit of commodity commodity risk component there, which um, the way again, the about the dollars for including that commodity pricing as part of the pricing of the retail. Uh, so it's the, the end customer is bear some of that. And you feel that we could almost promise the tenants to get their electricity cheaper than what they do now when yeah. SoCal is and that. That's fundamentally what you've experienced with all your places, right? Yeah, that, that's the okay. idea. Yeah, you got it. What's the current estimated uh, load of the district? So you're saying you'd have a capacity for 80 megawatt hours, right? Yeah, so um, we're currently, like we're currently, yeah, that was the battery. So I'll jump back to that real quick. So the battery, um, so there's really the three main components here solar generation. Yeah, but that doesn't work at night. Doesn't work at night. Yeah, so 80 is really the max capacity, right? Well, 20 megawatts, and then right. 80 megawatt hours. Yeah, yeah, so to, um, just to make a distinction between capacity and duration, um, so solar. 
it's a kind of generation megawatts, um, and then the battery output, which is the power that it can either take in or put out, is going to be the 20, meg 20 megawatts, but it would be four hour duration. So, megawatt hour is this volume of energy that is coming in out of the battery. Right. So, compared to the 20 megawatts, what's the current load today? And there's two numbers, right? Today's load and and what you've estimated based on future terms. Yeah, so um, this is all in the handouts. The words here, but uh, basically, the existing load is actually not that great. Five gigawatt hours. Um, space link load um, is, is actually significant. Um, as we understand it, it's um, basically four 1.8 megawatt loads, which is about 70. Megawatts. Um, in terms of what's the what's the, um, the how many watts is the running load, not the integrated power? I guess. Yeah. So the, uh, I think the question is how uh, much total capacity, and it's um, it's basically. Is it seven? Is that what I'm saying? I have it on the slide. Um, but it's basically seven with this baseline and the existing tenants are a little bit over a megawatt, so about about eight megawatts. Um, so the idea of being in, go back to the eight. So you have you're talking about building a capacity of twenty and we're using eight now. Well, I think twenty is the, the battery, right? And you have the additional ten for well, that's all you can gas count on generation. The battery, unless you want to start the generator or you have solar. So well, we might be blending on starting the generator. So I would, uh, Isn't it for balancing? We could think, yeah, you can think of the, the generator sort of utility uh, terminology. It's like a peaker plant. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna run it um, for, for load balancing, but our expectation is that that we will run it on a daily basis. So it's balancing maybe 10%. That's right. Yeah. Sure yeah. yeah. So 90% is coming from the battery during the day. Obviously, the solar keeps right. the batteries. Yeah. But you've got 20 capacity and we're only running eight, about 8 to 10 megawatts um, today. That's right. Well, today, it's even less. What is, it? what is it today? Today, it's, it's around 2 megawatts. 2. Okay. So you're talking about 10 times the capacity. Of what our max is. Yeah, so, yeah, so okay. we're talking about sequencing here is uh, I, I would not recommend building the whole system out if space only could be part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you start with a much smaller footprint if, if we're just talking about today's load. Very thin. Back a little bit here, going back to the, the map here, what um, what we've thought about is if space only doesn't happen in more account centers than the others, and all we're talking about is the existing load. I would uh, recommend a very partial first like baby step into this, which mm -hmm. would probably be just this part of the loop, um, not the whole thing. And I would consider um, and look at, we started to get into this um, a little bit beyond the scope of the initial study here, is potentially putting just a smaller bit of solar somewhere closer in. Um, and then say the bigger solar project when, when the bigger load shows up. So um, you might call it phase one A and one B. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. If absent a, a larger new load like space link, uh, you're not gonna want to build out the whole thing because we have kind of chance of Okay. And what's do you do an evaluation for us that compares uh, Assuming we just we took on the cost, let's say we get the wind tunnel proposal here, and they say we'll do it if you run the trunk line from Edison. Yeah. Or the alternative would be here. Right. Um, do we have a cost comparison of building out a power plant ourselves versus just tying in additional power demand? Uh, I mean, we we're, we're surrounded by some of the largest. Power generation yeah. farms in the world, right? So, uh, I mean, they just built a substation up Oak Creek there yeah, to right. handle all that. That's what I was just going to jump, jump ahead to. Is what you're talking about is the wind hub substation. Yeah, um, so it's right out here. Um, so yeah, so the 
the alternative, um, and it's not in the presentation, but I can speak to control of this analysis, with analysis, but um, the, the, so, what the current team is the bank of the substation, which is built to handle the area of yeah. solar. Um, the current capacity, uh, uh, I guess right now is about 460 almost um, megawatts of, of capacity, so plenty of capacity for lots of redevelopment. So the, um, the alternative would be to put in for the load application to take load from that substation and, and bring it down. Um, the, the challenge there is going to be timing and predictability of cost, right? Even predictability of timing. Um, so so cost plan will be tomorrow. We're in, but, but we're only in if you can you know, guarantee you'll have power by X date. Yeah. We won't be able to guarantee that because Edison will never yeah, to, to anything it could be three years. I think it's an extremely good case. Or it could be like five to ten years. They'd probably get a big diesel generator or something. And I, I don't think they need to do that. I think yeah. they'd get in line. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. So, so that's kind of the. I bet Calspan would do that. They would. We'd have to work something out like that. Right. Yeah. For the surge. Yeah. And so the yeah. so then the and alternatively, obviously, is to build your own. Our infrastructure to do that. We can build what we're talking about as an island mode to support them, uh, and we can do that on our own top line. And that can be done uh, yeah, amongst ourselves to you know, get that built. So, you know, the, not, not really a two year process, um, the potential of a faster impact, but uh, uh, depending on how incentivized they are to, to go fast. So, is it okay if I keep asking? I don't yeah, want to derail your presentation. You said interrupt as yeah, you did. Did. So, um, if if we entered into this relationship uh, and bought energy wholesale from you, and you've got maybe not initially ten times the capacity we need, but yeah. some excess, yeah. um, who gets the contract to sell back to the utility? Would that be you? It would be us. Yeah. Okay. And does that affect our rate based on how much you can or can't sell to them? And the reason I ask that is yeah. because they have a 800, how much the substation can handle? 800 something yeah. megawatts? 460. 460. So during the day when all the solar farms around here and the wind's blowing at 40 knots, it probably still exceeds the capacity of the substation or not? Because that used to be an issue before that was built, and they were being paid whether they produced or not. They ran an anemometer and kept track of what they would have made if they had right. not turned off all the wind turbines because there wasn't the capacity. Yeah, and so what, what you're getting at here is really... As you know, you're competing, in other words, you have a contract with them. Yeah. Who gets to sell the power? Who gets told to shut down by the computer? To, right. Are we going to be stuck? shutting down our excess capacity and then you're going to pass that burden on the you know if you can sell it obviously our energy gets cheaper right so yes yeah, so the way i would think about that is um we will price um the wholesale contract will take that into account mm -hmm. um, and and what you're what you're getting at is actually we're at a really interesting juncture in the grid as a whole as you, as you pointed out especially out here in the middle of the day on a hot summer windy day also, our the grid wholesale power is a different market than sort of the iron meter wholesale power uh, can go negative. In other words, or, or they have to shut them down or curtail it um, because there's, there's this excess renewables in the middle of the day and there's not enough batteries um, that exist on the grid to work. That's going to start changing. Uh, so, just like the quick. Uh, quick update on, on the legislation passed today, the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there's um, there's tax credits for standalone storage projects. So, mm -hmm. so that's starting now. And we've got um, three sites up north that we're developing that is just standalone storage. And our customer there is the, uh, the CCA, which is uh, it's like Central Coast Community Energy. They're procuring renewables out in the desert down here. They're bringing it home. And we're, we're going to be building them batteries 
closer to their mold as that's coming uh, as part of the grid. Um, to your question as it relates to, to this project is, I think we take that into account <coughs> our, our price of the, the wholesale and uh, be able to you know, take, basically take that risk uh, to put it in industry terms of merchant power risk. Uh, uh, that the merchant power is basically one contracted energy that uh, and ideally we'll be able to contract it, but uh, it's a dynamic market. And, more contracting for that, like two years or not, so that's a little manage of that. Okay, that makes sense. So, is the is there's a lot of excess capacity in this area, though, right? Even beyond that, that new substation can be this thing. Um, is that true? Uh, the I guess I wouldn't characterize it necessarily as excess energy. Uh, because most of the projects out here are uh, fully contracted. They've got PPAs or power purchase agreements uh, with whether it's you know, whether it be the or you know, some close the energy or even like Lancaster Trust Energy can, can buy uh, or basically sign these long term PPAs. And one of the other trends that's happening is we've got corporates that are also signing PPAs like Google. Okay. As long as the grid has the capacity. As long as the grid has the capacity. Right now out here there is capacity. Um, so even if everyone's producing. It, yeah, that's kind of right. so this this number here is yeah. taking into account all of that and they were uh, built. And so uh, so yeah, there's there's no capacity. Yeah, because there's virtually no I don't know I don't know the the, the correlation here, yeah. but there was no solar out here in the desert. Yeah. until that substation was built. And I don't know if that's just a coincidence because of other uh, incentives, but I know that the wind companies couldn't sell their power. Well, we're selling the power at maybe we're going to get full price or something, but yeah. the capacity was severely limited by not having that substation, yeah. for instance. Yeah, um, so that's not a coincidence that you're seeing so right now. Yeah. So ultimately, uh, when we talk about interconnecting this project, we'll ultimately tie in here as well. So our expectation for the flow that we tie to that substation and be able to you know, sort of play that wholesale market for some of the excess power. But the our sort of guiding principle on this is design the system that serves the site most first, and that's the that's the Whole line of the project, and then to the extent that there's some ex excess stuff on the margin to, to play with or deal with, I don't know. You know, that sort of separately, but theoretically, shouldn't change the answer for you guys as the subject. Yeah. So, with the new uh, energy bill that just was passed, yeah. federal energy bill, I'm assuming there's going to be similar to there was. 20 years ago, all kinds of grants and incentives and buy downs and for installation and yep. capacity, right? Yep. Uh, it seems like we might be competing with, you know, you get really green companies like Virgin and stuff that could cover their roof with solar with, you know, a 50% buy down from the federal government or something. So, you know, that's, yeah, there's a lot of rooftop around here on this side of the field. Right. Yeah, so now just to put it in the jump back to one of these other slides. Um, so, yeah, I would encourage, you know, if people want to put solar on the rooftops, I think that would be great. Um, but the the day, you start to move home, you need a lot of space to put the, this thing about future loads. Existing loads are, are not that great, but um, but I would say I think it's a good idea to max out rooftop if that if we're inclined to do that. Um, but, what, sorry, what kind of acreage are we talking about in order to achieve the 30 megawatts? Because I know we're talking rooftops, and I think that's great, but that's the only thing. Only, yeah, so like <laughs> so, so let's compare that to the rooftops. And how much that's going to get us? So I'm just trying to get it's a feel for it. Like, as yeah, as if everybody put rooftop solar panels, how much would it really matter? Yeah, but that's ten times. Well, actually, it's more than ten times. It's uh, 
15 times what our current utilization is. So if you took, well, if you divided that area by 10, we gotta, yeah. you could probably fit it all on the rooftops. So it couple, seems like. Couple things to think about this. Um, for the existing load, um, we're starting to get there. But the other the one thing to think about with solar capacity is uh, think about 30 megawatts of solar. Um, the rule of thumb is you can multiply that times 87 to 60 hours a year times about 19% is the, the capacity factor. Yeah. Yeah, we only have a little short today. Um, and the days are shorter. Um, so, so you have to do that math. But in any case, for today's load, you're still probably not really going to get there with with uh, with all the rooftops. You can start to approach it. Yeah. You start adding a new space like our cal span. It, and even uh, then, it's is is the consumption of power for a given organization correlated with the amount of rooftop space they have. I don't think that's a box they're going to check. I, I think it's an important consideration to think about. That is going to take a little bit of, out of our hide, but I, I don't. But they're already grid time. I mean, so that, that's not an apples to apples. They don't have to produce as much as they consume. If there's an incentive that half, that 50% of the cost of the installation is covered by the federal government by a grant that's just coming online now. So I'm not arguing that they they're may not lower their bills 30% or 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's much less, you know, there's much less demand. And we're going to sell a lot less, for instance, if we even consider this. Yes, but I, I think their ratios are, uh, my gut check is that the ratios are a little bit different in that it's not going to cover as much and that they're still going to uh, require uh, power consumption and there are still potential customers, even though the number may not be as high as what we currently think because they may install, um, you know, like rooftop solar. Yeah, the, the other consideration is that cost to build just for simple ground now, uh, a lot cheaper than the top, especially if it's retrofit. Um, so if you've got space, it, uh, it's going to make sense to use the spit the open space that you've got. Uh, if you're in an urban area or if you see there's an ag, ag area where you've got prime ag land, you don't want to take ag property out of production, but put everything on the rooftops. Uh, but if you've got open space and you guys do, I would skew towards the least cost ground up. Well, I used to work for one of the largest tenants on the airport, yeah. and I was in management and strongly encouraging them to put in carports with solar panels yeah. and cover the roofs when there was incentives there. So my point is, all our tenants could do that with these new incentives coming up, so, not just limited to the rooftops even. Yeah, so let's talk about the incentives. Um, so the, the incentives, um, there's definitely incentives coming. Um, the average race of solar and batteries is a little bump, but it's um, it's the same. It's basically the same incentive that's been there for for a couple of decades. Actually, it's the investment tax credit, the ITC. It's starting to ratchet down, but with the, the current bill, the current uh, incentive for the bill is 26 percent tax credit. Uh, the, the current bill today bumped it back up to thirty percent and expended it. So that's yeah. you know, that's kind of the main. The main and there was California had a buy down when it was fifty percent. Yeah, of the, the installation cost. Right. So that doesn't exist anymore. So right. That's but that's if there right may now. be something like that coming out with the federal money. We, yeah, we're not we seeing that out. in the current bill. Um, there, there may be. Um, we expect there will be some grants uh, related to microgrids, but not so yeah. much uh, straight solar. Um, on the state outcomes of all the incentives that have already come and gone is that they succeed in one of their missions, which is to drive the cost of solar right. ground. So that, that worked. So solar is actually pretty cheap now. It's the, the cheapest form of, of energy put up. Um, so that's a great outcome. Uh, so, but, but that also means that the incentives are now being pushed more towards stuff that need the incentives more, like standalone batteries or long duration low batteries and things like that. Um, so the incentives are really moving more towards the stuff that's still a little expensive. And mm -hmm. Solar doesn't meet that description anymore. That's kind of right. one way to think about kind of just conceptually what the incentives are too long. To me, I only see there's like 60 acres up there in the yellow. Yeah. 
I don't see more than a few acres of rooftops, you know, so we're talking like 20 times the capacity. If that's yeah, but accurate. that would give us 10 times, more than 10 times capacity of what we need right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree that cost of rooftop is way more than ground. Um, another concern I have, maybe we can address this, is I don't have any factual data out of it, but my instinct seeing all these solar panels going out in the desert yeah. is that uh, everything dies underneath them and you get erosion. Like the dust is worse out here and stuff, you know, like, yeah, like it seems like, I don't know if you have an experience with that, there's, yeah, you know, the, the ground cover that holds the desert from blowing away the top, call it the topsoil, it's yeah. not much of a topsoil, but there is, you know, I know that when we've gone and landscaped the airport in years mm -hmm. past, and then the next windstorm, the it was terrible, I and mean, then the dust was ten times worse. I can see nodding over here. Well, yeah, we had to put some like they called it brown snot down. Yeah, you would, uh, yeah, <laughs> or plant something. Work. So it was like, oops, we shouldn't have, you know, killed the brown cover, and yeah. that becomes a some of that. Um, most of our experience in the north, where you get grass growing, it's kind of the output of the vegetation you got to manage uh, for the really. It's, it's all location specific, but you know, being out in the desert here, um, you're right, that's, that's something to, to manage. Um, have to, we, didn't, we didn't look at that specifically here, but um, that'll be a factor. You must have some experience with that doing ground based desert installations. I don't know if there's any yeah. environmental stuff. I'm not worried about turtles per se, tortoises are in, but. Yeah, as much as just, I think there's like an erosion issue potentially. Yeah. Basically, yeah. everything dies underneath it. Oh, can you go back to that? Oh, yeah. no, Sorry. I think that's a reasonable um, question, but yeah, I wouldn't make the assumption. Like I said, I don't know. Yeah. It's just my gut feel is that everything's going to die under that. And well, I've well, seen the effects of erosion. Bob, if you look to the right side, the freeway go by, you see that one area about halfway up where, where Caltrans graded the land to get the fill dirt yeah. all the way to the right. You, there you go. Yeah, we have that. But it's still a still big way. lawsuit. It hasn't been set right. with Caltrans exactly. because the wind yeah. picked up all that. And there was accidents and, right on the freeway. Yeah, big pileups from yeah. from dust and blowing actually, over. So that thing's real close to the 14, for instance, when you get a a crossing project on the uh, northwest side of 14, just about straight across. There's another area. And fortunately, they were able to reestablish some of the vegetation there to solve the problem. So my, and my people sense, were killed, right? There was no oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So my sense is, um, I'll get back to you with a better answer on it. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I have to imagine it's been solved by the time. I would think project. it has been because it's it's going to be a huge issue after. Yeah. With, with, with the well, business. or it's just a, you know, a county that. Is very tolerant and doesn't care, you know. But well, like we right said, there. we've had. I think it's it's kind of been mitigated to some point. Yeah. yeah. Let, let us know if you know where they yeah, got or... about it. Uh, on the yeah. Uh, but I got to imagine it's been addressed uh, before. But I mean, to your point, I, I guess when you talk about that, then we have to consider our tenants because they wanted to put a solar park, uh, uh, basically off the uh, the end of uh, four. I'm sorry, two two. Yeah, the out there, field. and the airport opposed it. Yeah, yeah, you go a little bit over to the brown area, just to the west of town. Yeah. Down, go down, right in there. Okay. And we were concerned that the dust problem could affect some of our tenants and their cleaning rooms and stuff like that. And we were opposed it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, we'll, uh, so it is a concern. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. I'll, I'll get back to you. See, just a time check. I'm sorry to talk all day. So, um, how are you guys? No, we're doing all right. I mean, yeah. if we still have questions, it's worthwhile to answer them, but otherwise, we'll yeah. just continue. Yeah. Let's see. So, we've jumped around a bit. Um, so, what I, the handouts here that I, that I gave you was the first eight pages of the Galactic proposal. Um, so, this slide is really just a summary of what we got there. But um, basically, um, the, the process we went through. The, the, I mentioned the loads, uh, those loads. Um, we looked at you know, technical, commercial, permitting, regulatory, and all of the above. Like, what are all the things that you need to do to build a project like this? So, we went through, through that. Um, I think the 
the other diversity, um, I mentioned it earlier, but it, it's an important one to, to keep in mind. You know, again, think about like Calspan versus Space Center. It's a, a, a contrasting load profiles where Calspan is super spiky. I understand it's uh, some versions of, of their design would be like 20 megawatt load that could wander off. And that's mm -hmm. those technical challenges. Um, not insurmountable, but separate from the design to wear it. Um, space links, the, the total opposite, where it's basically um, some satellite dishes that have, have a good energy demand, but basically run flat all the time. And that's actually a very easy load to serve. Um, so, and then you've got everything in between. Um, so that's something that to keep in mind as, as the project you know, the infrastructure you know, to serve those different types of load as they, uh, as they come about. Is there any move um, politically to go back to a deregulation of the grid like there was yeah. 20 years ago? Uh, good question. Um, so let me frame it up for folks who might not be familiar with what we're talking about. So um, what you're referring to is um, a little bit of history on California uh, grid. Is in 1978, there was the public practice of federal uh, public utility regulatory policy act program. And California at that time, uh, this is coming out of the oil crisis in the 70s, um, California at the time was moving towards deregulation. So there was a lot of Incentives from the federal side, there was um, political will at the state level to deregulate the, the, the grid. And it, it did its job. It actually, uh, we built a ton of infrastructure at that time in the 80s and then the second wave in the 90s. What ended up happening is um, and it, it, ended, it, it all culminated in Calpine gaming the system and kind of screwing it up for everybody and keeping it up bankrupt. And so the state re regulated everything at that time and basically shut down energy development for a couple of decades, basically. The question to the good one is is there any appetite or political uh, sort of momentum at all to deregulate again? And the answer is sort of. And, and what I mean by that is um, it's sort of uh, broad deregulation, I would say no. Um, and bitten by that, each of these second bankruptcy <coughs> that they just came out of didn't help that either. Uh, so I don't think there's a lot of faith or political will to try to do that again. But, and this is where it gets really interesting, is um, the community choice aggregators, or CCAs, um, uh, basically, what, what that is is it's communities stepping up to take control of their own power. So the one closest to you guys is Lancaster Tools Energy, which is how they're operating. Um, regulations were put in place where communities can go procure wholesale power on behalf of their community and, and sell it to their constituents. And so that's what's happening. You mean like long-term contracts? Yeah. So Lancaster or our our own CCA or more. Uh, Central Coast Community, Virginia Surge, and that one Surge, Monterey County, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, um, Santa Cruz, and San Benito. Um, they'll go sign, they'll go procure power through our purchase agreements on behalf of, of their community. So that, in a way, is a form of deregulation. And so that is, that's actually gotten a lot of good momentum, and I think it's going to be the way of the future for most of the state. Uh, so I mean, the deregulation that's happening is going to, I, my view is it's going to be happening through that mechanism. Uh, so I think mean, that's that's how it's going to play out in California. Yeah, I, I asked that question for the rest of the board if you're not familiar, but it, the reason I ask is because we're, we're trading, we have grid power now. But that's who we buy our power from. We're talking about getting in an exclusive contract with a power producer who's going to locate heat locally and then uh, you know the trade-off is should we be buying from what's you know what's the future of the current grid we're buying from if it gets deregulated there's going to be price fluctuations could even be down yeah. uh, versus getting locked into something with you right. uh, I know 20 some years ago when they were deregulated maybe it was more but uh, 
you know, I was buying my residential electricity from Green Mountain Energy on the East Coast. Yeah. That was like, you know, Edison was just distribution. And so, and I was paying a lot less and getting green power. And then Enron and everybody else and the, the collusion, whatever else happened, they put a stop to the deregu you know, re regulated it. Right. And also my rates shot back up and yeah. all these independent green energy producers were taken out of the California yeah. market. Yeah, no, I think you, you're reading it exactly right. That's, that's mm -hmm. what happened and it's a really smart question in terms of could, could, it, like, could it change again, maybe not go back to exactly the same, but could it be a different regulatory framework that, that, that we're not thinking about now, that 10 years from now is to be or even less. You know, just thinking the yeah. incentives of this new bill yeah. could incentivize California to like start moving in that direction. I, I, I think I, my sense is the moment to regulate it regulated differently was when PG went bankrupt. So actually, I, I thought that there's a missed opportunity for the, the PUC to say, hey, PG, we don't like how you're operating, but we're going to do this different now. Uh, and they actually didn't do that. Like let them fail. It, sort of, well, basically, let's, let's relegate them to just distribution. But, you know, one outcome that I think would, uh, my personal opinion, could have been a good outcome for, for the state would be let pg &E, split up pg &E, gas and electric. That should be two different things. Let the electric be just distribution mm -hmm. and the gas be deregulated, which it is already. Uh, they didn't do that. To some of our small producers. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's, it's a, if it then it goes in that direction, it's a ways off because they sort of just missed an opportunity to, to do it. Uh, the CCAs are in the kind of corporate to buy to sign EPA contracts on the renewable side. Uh, so that's, those two trends have a lot of that. Okay. So no, Tim has a series of questions. Um, at what yeah. point in your presentation is appropriate? No, this is, this is good. We, we jumped all over the place. So uh, let me just see if there's anything else. Um, I'm happy to share these slides with you as well. It's mostly what's in your, your packets here. It's just the PowerPoint format. Yeah, I think good. Let's, uh, let's jump into it. OK. Um, <clears throat> and Brian, these questions were um, passed along from Todd. Uh, I think it's just to kind of help the um, the board understand a little bit more about how this this project would uh, some of the the fine details for the project that's teased out from the information that you provided. Um, I, they they're kind of short answer, but as I told you before, if it's something that's proprietary or you don't feel comfortable answering in a public session, let um, uh, just let us know at that point, and then we'll coordinate with our attorney and make sure that uh, we we get that uh, answer in appropriate form. Okay. Um, and you kind of touched on this, but uh, could you just give us, um, do you have any other completed projects in Concentric's history that's similar to the, this airport um, as that you can use as a reference that we can reach out to? Yeah, I would say uh, the most similar, and it's not uh, completed yet, is the Gonzalez project. Um, but yeah, happy to uh, make introductions there. Uh, the other one that um, I didn't get built and, and Going uh, a different direction, but I'm not going to make an introduction here as well. Is locally, we spend a lot of time with Lancaster. Um, and some of the background on the Gonzalez projects that we spent um, a lot of time with Lancaster putting together the commercial structure that we ended up using at Gonzalez for the rest of the years here. Um, so I have to guys know uh, Jason Cottle, the city manager at Lancaster. Um, I'm happy to make an introduction there as well. But then, and then one of the reasons that one didn't end up happening was it was for a cannabis industrial park, which has its own dynamics. Um, it's mentioned in the EDA that uh, Concentric stands ready to build, maintain, and finance the um, airport project. Can you share uh, Concentric's audited books for our review to confirm financial readiness? Um, sure. Yeah, the, I mean, the short answer is um, we don't uh, do audit and financials. Um, if that's a requirement, we do that. Um, the slightly longer answer is um, 
the way we're, we're set up as a company, we're definitely capitalized at the corporate level. And so what I mean by that is kind of uh, you know, development organization. Uh, we have a lot of partners that we can introduce uh, to as well. Um, on the, so the EPC, that's the engineer procurement construction side of things. Um, and then generally the way we structure project finance is each project has its own LLC. So it's like that people stand alone. So project finance in the finance world has a, has a specific meaning, which is to say that it's um, sort of standalone finance that is on the, on the back of the project itself. So as we have here, uh, this is tricky with all the loans as part of the commercial structure. It's like not with Frank Casper, is um, the, the underlying credit that supports the financing is the interest. Um, so in other words, if you were able to bring in financing, um, in this case, you have great tenants, you know, Brennan and Galactic, Bergen, um, and the like. Um, so, the, so the project financing is uh, really sort of standalone and part of my life. In any case, I'm happy to share information on all that. Are you saying you're dependent on them as investors? Not as investors, um, but to the extent that the um, think about it is um, project finance role, and this is fairly common for infrastructure projects, is look at look at the contracted revenue. So the contracted revenue here is the you know, your attendance buying power of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you think about it, put on your on a bank lender, I'm going to look at the, I'm going to underwrite this project based on the credit of the organization. And the reason I, I wanted to share some of that insight is it actually ends up working out really nicely for the public utility. So in the case of the public utility, it's also going to capital again. One of their criteria was that they weren't in a position and they want to put their general fund at risk at all to build the project. In other words, it had to be by their definition, like very arm's length from the rest of their city budget. So mm -hmm. the, the same thing would be true here, where you know, you've got your operating budget that we do every day, but we don't want to do this project, jeopardize that at all. So it's got to be standalone, and sort of non report budget plan. So that's, um, that's the way. Infrastructure projects. Yes, your financing is dependent on um, something a lot stronger than a letter of intent. In other words, you would need a contract. If you build it, we would have an obligation, and so would our tenants. Like all of us would, we'd have a contract with them, and we'd have, and they'd have, they'd have a contract with us yeah. for retail, and we'd have a contract with them for wholesale. And that would then get the financing. And that's that's basically yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Brian, could you confirm bonding capabilities? Capabilities. Um. Yeah. So um, maybe I can get back to uh, a more confidential way, but um, I would say generally speaking, our bonding in the past um, our our and that there's less expensive ways to provide the same security. Um, so. Okay. Um, do you have any vendors that you will bring to the project? And if so, could we have a reference list of those vendors in order to confirm a bit ability and financial readiness? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is um, we do have preferred uh, suppliers for each of the main components. Um, and, but I would also say that it's a pretty dynamic market, especially in, with anything that's about to happen with the, the new incentives. Um, so what I'll propose uh, bring so far and introduce to some of our sort of top of the list, short, short list of suppliers, but ultimately we're going to need some more uh, in, the, in the end of the day, you know, we'll probably but if you guys said yes, let's go green light today, we're still a year away from placing major orders. You know, it's going to be like jam. So, just that. But yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, has the FAA or any um, other regulatory agency been contacted to confirm no issues regarding solar or other DERs suggested for this project? Uh, we've not uh, talked to the FAA directly. 
done some background work and some regulation that they understand them. Um, in some ways, um, I think we're going to be wanting to work hand out with you guys on that. But at the end of the day, that's you guys are way closer to that business than we are. Um, but having said that, we, the, there's there's two areas that, that we identified that the FDA I think is going to want to be. Um, Involved with one is going on the runways um, and actually we've got sort of mark up here. There's an alternative spot to go under which already exists. Obviously, I think that that's probably the founding here to avoid the FAA. Um, and then there's also glare analysis. It's um, pretty typical of solar anywhere near an airport. That's a little no way have to deal with that. Otherwise, uh, the other thing that, uh, that we brought to our attention, that we brought it up even, um, is um, sort of height, and specifically um, stack height on, on engine stacks um, within and have the cone. Yeah, the right the right right. So those are the, I guess, three three things that we were really, like, um, but I would say we'd be looking you guys to, to help us navigate the FAA. Because Okay. Um, do you intend to use any third party uh, firm's test to perform the project analysis in that, to confirm no fatal flaws identified? Yeah, so um, typically, uh, again, the short answer is yes. Um, but, and where that really uh, comes into play uh, for us is, as I just talked about, for non recourse project finance, our investors um, always want to have an independent engineer for commercial information. Um, you kind of t talked a little bit about this, but I just want to ask this question directly. Um, can you share with us uh, the load density and low model used to factor our current and future kilowatt loads so we can review that information? Yeah, so uh, this is getting into um, some proprietary stuff, um, but yes, we can share that with you. Yeah, uh, the function we take <coughs> is. Um, We've got a simulation model um, that is, uh, basically takes interval data, uh, either existing or model, uh, each of the loads, runs it through the simulation, um, and then and then basically runs a whole bunch of different scenarios on different variations uh, to optimize for cost and performance and all this. So uh, yeah, we have to share outputs on that. Great. And that alludes to the next question about just asking for help uh, us to understand the financials regarding kilowatt costs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if, uh, about sort of the back end, what fed into uh, what we, we put up here is um, the simulation model we just talked about basically takes the loads and then matches that up with the configuration to the level. Um, and then once you have that configuration, it's kind of an iterative process if there's a, a budget associated with that. So, uh, we have our simulation model, our budget model, our performance model, and they take out basically uh, all the, the financials. So, yeah, we can uh, share that with you. Would it be possible to obtain um, uh, any kind of financial partners in reference to this project? Um, yeah, so um, the interesting thing is, so the answer here is similar to the, the supplier side, uh, which is um, there's actually a lot of capital from the space right now, and I think there's about to be a lot more. So um, a lot of the, the financial side of it is going to be dependent on timing. Um, so there's an anecdotal that um, we'll talk about the Gonzales project again. Uh, we've been going through detailed engineering and basically meeting all the conditions precedent in the contract. Uh, and trying to lock down finance excuse me, a year ago, it probably would have been a different partner than what we're um, locking down today. And again, anecdotally, um, this is a, a partner there is most likely going to be a fund that uh, just raised Four hundred fifty million dollars to invest in projects like this, and they just closed the fund, which is to say they uh, got all their, their capital committed in June. But again, if we'd been trying to do it back in December, it would have been a different answer. Um, but um, but yeah, the I guess the, the way I think about it is we're having to be transparent with you in terms of how we're doing that. 
Um, I think you kind of taught the answer to this, but just, just to confirm, have you done any environmental air quality review um, yet? So um, on the, uh, the app down here, so we're more just worried about the, the, the air permit side of things um, as we were about the various species, the choices, and uh, you know, yeah, like that. But in any case, uh, we, did look, we did look at the, uh, so quick. Um, in, in regards to that, um, yeah. would your organization be uh, open to considering a part, possible partnership with another firm to complete required environmental reviews as required with the FAA? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Dr. let me ask a question. When you've done your other six, the county been the lead agency and have they run the environmental review? So um, I think we're here to the CQA. Um, so the tallest one in the I'm back to that it's an analogy. Um, that one was the city. Um, and I believe the county did, it's in Kern County. Um, so that, that's what I took. Um, how will costs vary with project rollout? Yeah, so um, this is kind of get to the uh, you know, baby steps or uh, you know, well, you know, they got to the gate. Um, and so, um, our uh, in principle, the way we, ideally, what we do is be able to, to match the fill, fill out with the load that's there. So, what we don't want to do is way over bolded. it. Have to not show up, right? That'd be good. Unless you can sell it to the grid. Unless you can sell it to the grid for the right price. Um, right. That for the right price is the trick. So the grid wholesale is not very attractive. So, so I think you, you want to be able to, and it also comes back to the finance side of it, which is, as you were pointing out, we need to have the retail agreements in place to. Close the finance. Uh, so, in other words, you want to match the build out with the load as it as it showed up. Having said that, part of the design inherent in the design is going to be provisions to be able to build it when they do show up. So, in other words, uh, you might want to back here. Um, but we'll we'll have as part of all this is the right infrastructure or provisions for the right infrastructure to, to add it as a, as a so if that means running some extra cable on the ground or empty conduit and pull later so this these numbers for capacity if it's 10 times what our current demand is is that really the phase one numbers? Well, you yes. said it would be incremental. Is this the yeah. first increment or is this the goal? So the way we define phase one. After we, you know, if these tenants aren't there. Yeah, we, we, we define phase one as existing tenants plus space length. Space length isn't part of the equation when you break this up into phase one A and one B. Right. I guess I would prefer to see a phase one with just the existing tenants. Yeah. Even if it's you know as a placekeeper, does that make sense? I can see the argument. You know, can we make for it? I mean, you can still show here's here's phase one. That's because yeah. it's kind of over promising. It's like, well, that may be the right thing to do for your investors to say, well, if they're you know imminent is this giant surge in demand, and they're going to have a lot more clients, and yeah. it's going to be a bigger build out. But yeah. I would think that. What I'd like to see is phase one is what we have now, yeah. and what you propose there, and then phase with the infrastructure for the growth to phase two, which includes you know any or all of these other potential candidates. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. As yeah, with the if we were to do a phase one that way, and there isn't excess capacity to grow, and we're locked into we must purchase from, but, but if there is, we're grid cut. It's never an issue. It's not like we're desperate here. But how would would that change? And I have concerns about pricing and just what the details of that mechanism would look like if we were to do a phase one that is on the current hundred percent capacity. As a, a, it's questions to ask when details start to get fleshed out. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think um, part of what you're touching on is if uh, you go to the smaller phase one, uh, just to find it differently, um, kind of naming conventions on the phase, um, the initial phase one, which would be the smaller build, um, is going to be dependent on interconnection, most likely. Uh, so in other words, uh, it'll be a little bit slower, but to your point, we're not desperate, as we said right now, we have power. Um, but I think the benefit of taking that approach, as opposed to waiting until something comes from a bigger player, um, you've already taken those first steps and you've got, you've got the, the sort of foundation built to be able to bring in bigger loads quickly when they do come. And if I'm trying to sell to new tenants, or to say another way, attract new tenants away from Florida or Texas or wherever, they come here instead, you can say, look, we've already built the big one, or it's in progress, and when you come, we'll, we'll build what you need. Yeah, if it takes them a year to build out, you'd, you'd leave them, you'd have it installed before they were ready to operation. Exactly. Yeah. So, again, I'd like to see. I think a more logical phase one is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all hypothetical. It doesn't mean that's the way you would do it. But, I, yeah. you know, when we're looking at um, the yellow area with so many acres and saying, well, that's way more area than there is rooftops, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. If really phase one is considerably smaller, you could have two colors, one for phase one and phase two, so we can still talk about both. But, you know, like you haven't shown us the next, it looks like phase one is already, at least as far as production, already has all the allocation shown on the map, whereas, yeah. you know, what you don't see is the, the, ga the gauge of the wider size and all that stuff. Yeah, Obviously, right. you put that in the right. start. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, you know, we can uh, slice it. Uh, a bunch of different ways, and uh, for like amazing. Like there's some that obviously the, the engine comes in, you're not going to put in a one megawatt generator and then uh, maybe you would, and then replace it with a bigger one, or you add a second one. I don't know if there's yeah. so there's some things that don't scale or they get yeah. uh, so that it does matter, right? And some threshold your investors probably don't even want or an interest in this project if our current capacity and when no growth happens, you know, then we're wasting our time because you can't even get the funding because yeah, no, there, there's no guarantee that we're gonna attract these tenants. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I think um I think you're coming out right in terms of for the building block mm -hmm. um and you know what you mentioned on the engine is correct. You know, we would have multiple engines, um, and then we would build it in a way that you can add more later as you go. Um, batteries work the same way, roughly. Uh, so for that matter. Uh, so one of the one of the first we, we talked about is, for example, you know, sort of baby step away. Maybe you go just the south and the south part of the roof. Uh, this is like there's lots of discussion, but uh, you know, maybe you put a little more solar here. You know, the rooftop, a couple of inches, a smaller build here, and your first step is you know, just south of it. Yeah. Does this presentation, I apologize, do you have a next phase in this presentation beyond phase one shown? Uh, we, we, have, we haven't developed that part yet. Okay. Yeah. So I think it'd be more realistic at a minimum just to have an A and a B or a one and a two or yeah. something because chances are you're not going to hit that. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing yeah, that we talked about sure. with, uh, with Todd before we left was, um, okay, if we go into phase two and beyond, like, beyond this, even this build is, and we started to build that here, we just talked about some options on properties, uh, to kind of fill in the square of the pier. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, that's something that as we go, we'll obviously support in cooperation on the land side. Hey Brian, just two more quick questions for you really quick. Yeah. Um, outside of the power purchase agreement, will there be any additional costs or financial commitments from the airport? Um, costs, no. Um, financial commitments, we simply talked about the sort of contract structure. Um, when we find the contracts to 
And then finally, uh, can you just explain really quick what project optionality is? Or was that what you were discussing with the phasing? Uh, it's a phasing. Yeah, okay. It's just optionality and being able to uh, be a little bit nimble. <laughs> About so and we talked about the station the Cal scan, but uh, having the technical ability to <coughs> add components as you go, uh, you know, let's say seven years from now, you've got a different slate of potential new tenants in different locations, and being able to sort of future proof the project as much as possible. Give yourself options. So, I guess something I would the reason I'm asking you to show them, let's say, a two phase thing is. Yes. You're showing a potential tenant who you'd have a contract with yeah. that their energy needs are probably greater than the entire all the tenants combined currently. Yeah. Okay. So it's a big step. It's not a tiny increment. And so presumably your pricing structure to us would be contingent upon like when that happened, there's some economy of scale, there'd be some renegotiation. I'd, I'd just like some insight into what how you think that would go. Yeah, because presumably you'd also pitch that to your investors, like we're gonna have to spend this much more money, but this client's coming in. It's a long-term contract for this, that, and the other. Yeah. You know, are we gonna. In other words, if it's very small initially, yeah. and the price is not that competitive or advantageous over the grid, yeah. but you're but you're gonna incentivize us for saying, and when we get the next client, the price is gonna drop thirty percent. You know, I just. Yeah. Or is it going to not change? Yeah, and, it's, it's you know, more the latter. The way we generally think about it, but I would say it's the negotiating point for sure. But where we can be flexible on this is generally, yeah, I guess, Jimmy Dahl's flaw is the first phase for us is not going to be as profitable as later. So, in other words, we'd rather, I'd rather price it now and not have to change the pricing later. Mm -hmm. But we can do it the other way around too, which is uh, you know, press it out and then a bigger load company. Well, whatever, whatever, so. whatever you're proposing, I guess, is what I yeah. suggest. If there is a change yeah. and that was your expectation, and include that in your proposal of yeah. how you how would phase. If the, if, if the long term contract is renegotiated with phase two growth yeah. and we get an incentive for that, yeah. because what we're weighing is we've got energy yeah. now. Yeah. Um, it's pretty green, you know. If you look out there, there's an awful lot of windmills and solar panels in the desert adjacent to us. So it's not like we're becoming green when we aren't. We're buying energy that's being produced pretty green right now. Yeah. Um, so what's our incentive, and how do we pass that on to our to the community? You know, we have an obligation to do the best to grow this community and support yeah. you know our mission statement, which may be giving them cheaper energy and. Yeah. And more capacity and, and all that. So, right. I know you can't tell us exactly what the price is, but there's some kind of model that you've done. And again, we could do this in closed session or something if we had to, just to give us an idea. Of why should why, why should we play with you? And if, yeah, it's, if it's a very modest start, but there's a growth and a big cost savings, or if it's a long term contract already at that lower price, yeah. how do you think that? How does that? How does that compare? I'd be curious to see what the incentive is. Sure. Yeah, no, uh, I'm happy to, to, to go through and do that. Uh, our base case is um, pricing it sort of a little bit aggressively from our perspective up front and having a kind of price that is the same for, for all phases of growth. Um, but we're also, we also have some flexibility uh, if we want to do a phase one price differently than a bigger phase two, that's we can do that too. So um, our experience is being able to. And I, I think this is maybe one of the benefits of working with us is uh, we've got flexibility to be able to do what works better for you guys. Yeah. Um, and we'll come out of the game with a you know, our base case, but, but we're happy to, to kind of shape those curves, so to speak. Would it be indexed to something? We've, we've played around different indexes, um, mostly around escalators. Um, so the pricing, there's kind of goal to the two different kinds of pricing. There's the, the cost of energy, and then there's the housing escalator of time of the propulsion. So, um, so X dollar per kilowatt hour, uh, and then escalator hit, you know, Y percent a year. And so the, that escalator is where we spent most of our time on other projects talking about indexes. Um, so 
for an example, to a year ago, a year ago, inflation was going on. Yeah. And uh, gas prices were going on. And so everyone was like, oh, that's where we should be with zero. And then, like, a year later, we've got inflation and we've got you know, natural gas prices at, like, you know, 20 year highs. And it's like, well, I'm glad we put some index in that. So, uh, so, yeah, so we can, we can definitely, and my expectation is that we will get into that and negotiate the kind of ESA that's our industry is And we can also form an ad hoc committee to sit down with them to discuss all of these things in detail. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm not asking from details DSA. now. I'm just giving them an idea of my expectations of things I'd be looking for. Yeah, yeah. we're we're a ways away. From, yeah, sure. All of those terms. Yeah, and that was um, that was kind of our experience there. And so in that case, they did a, a public bid process that we really required to, um, and, and we ended up we won bid. Uh, we got selected and we entered into an MOU which had some binding aspects to it while we negotiated the ESA, which unfortunately that one happened, but we was just hit so it's like the one we wanted it to, but uh, it took a year to negotiate the ESA. Um, and, and now we're, uh, that budget's a couple of years ago. This one, just the word is going to cycle that. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my expectation. Any other questions? How about members of the public? No. So what's the next step from here? So this is an information item, so there's no action for the board to take. If the <coughs> what is consent for next step? Yeah, I was just uh, got that slide here somewhere. Actually, let me go back to. Yeah, so um, when I was going to, so I think what we just described in terms of commercial next steps uh, makes sense is if um, you know, there's some consensus that this is looking interesting, uh, we can uh, we'll, we'll go ahead you know, I got some homework assignments here to, to go uh, to retain this a little bit, uh, but if it looks like it's heading in the right direction, what I would propose if we mix up would be an MOU uh, or something similar. Uh, to you know, basically frame up how we want to move forward, and then the end game there would be an energy service agreement. Uh, so those are kind of the next big commercial next steps. There are two things that I would say um, that I would recommend we work on uh, sooner than later. One is the resolution uh, to formalize the treatment as a utility. I'm fairly straightforward, notwithstanding any legal. We do the I know what we talked about mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it seems to me that's a pretty low cost, low risk thing to just get done. Whether you said you know, like me or concept director, whatever you want to do it differently, it doesn't hurt to have that. So you know, I recommend go ahead and do that. Um, and then the other one um, is not in significant either, which is um, submitting an application for for interconnection. Uh, I touched on this a little bit. But uh, the piece I didn't mention that's important here is there's a small window every April to submit your application. If you miss that window, you, you get delayed a year and sometimes two years. And plus your 14 actually got, got delayed another year, so it's a two year process. And there's a little bit of engineering that needs to be done just to, you know, for the application to be complete. So what I would recommend is make sure you get into cluster 15 um, and even if it's you know, let's let's do some work together just for the sake of getting in that application otherwise you end up you could be delayed in several years if you, if you don't do that so those, that, those are a couple of things i would recommend uh, to, 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 to follow up on the mental people on, on the way here so um got a little bit of time but i just wanted to flag it like i missed that one the president for a meeting at or in the horn into the discussions on this. Some of the stuff that we have to discuss in the box as well. All right, well, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for spending yeah. your time with us today. Yeah. It's much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh,
Um, yeah, so yeah, we'll chat anytime. Just put it on there on the front cover here. Um, I'll, I'll reach out and give you guys uh, a contact information. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's see. And then show. We have the remainder of the CEO's report. I'll try to make it brief. Um, Scott um, uh, was uh, um, asked to just provide a brief discussion on the uh, justification for insurance. Um, I think we, we were talking in the last meeting about the, uh, the reasons why an airport shouldn't uh, get involved into a handkeeper's insurance, but we need more of an explanation. And I, I, I'm about 90% done on the memo to the board. I just got some more information from our insurer this morning. So you don't mind deferring this till next meeting that I'll have something in writing for you. Sure, and just to close loop to everybody else, the reason we're still discussing this, I know um, at the last meeting, I think the phrase was brought up, ah, yes, we found a solution where Grace is happy. I called Grace and said, okay, are you happy? And she's Grace. Of course she said, yes, I'm happy, I'm always happy, and then very diplomatically explained the areas that still hadn't been filled in. Yeah. So I just want you know a coherent answer so that we can present it as, hey, this is this is why we did think about it. This is why we've come to the conclusion we've come to, just to make sure we've answered everything. So thank you. Um, just real quick, uh, I think you guys have all heard about the inland port that's been approved by um, the Board of Commissioners for Kern County. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys about that. And then uh, I think that it's important for us to continue to plan ahead for potential future uh, intermodal facilities uh, which might include cargo uh, aircraft operations at the airport. So I'll be we're, I'll be talking and keeping our our engineering firms uh, up up to speed on what's going on, so they can keep it in the back of their heads, so we can start thinking how is this going to have an impact on our operation? How do we plan to to move forward with that that uh, type of facility that's going to be very close by to us? Um, Kim uh, Kimley Horn uh, has um, uh, we have a. Um, Basically, a work, uh, it's a work order. It's an additional work to a contract that we already have with Kinley Horn uh, to go ahead and plan and research and do the footwork for us to, to establish a supersonic corridor, or at least propose a supersonic corridor and work with the R2508 complex folks to, 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 to get approval or to, to seek approval. Um, the, the dollar amount of this um, of this change, uh, does, I checked with Scott, um, does not uh, require the board approval, just a bit that the airport um, that we notified the board of it. Um, so for the work that's going to be performed is, um, uh, sorry, they're gonna do the research and um, process for, for hypersonic sonic operations. Um, uh, review the complex operations accessibility, uh, work with uh, 2508 uh, Central Coordinating Facility, uh, and then work with the FAA uh, to um, amend any kind of agreements with air traffic control. And, uh, I'm sorry, that's Kim Horn. Um, and then, uh, um, then to, uh, to um, uh, do some of the stakeholder meetings for support. Uh, technical memorandum of, uh, of findings and also project management. The total for this uh, uh, change would be $42,400. So um, I'm just advising the board if there's any concerns about out there. <laughs> no, I, I understand. It's in, it's in airspace controlled by, you know, other, other government entities I, that regulate all that. I agree. I think that the the reason why we're pursuing it is because um, we have the ability to coordinate um, and make this available to the flying public that, that utilize the Mojave Spaceport. And so I think it's, it's uh, in a way, it not only supports our existing tenants, but potentially future tenants that like to test in area. I guess what I'm saying is if this is a national priority, it's going to happen whether we do anything or not. I don't understand. It's out of our jurisdiction, and it's not clear to me that we actually do anything that you listed that, 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 that the contractor would do. In other words, once it's established, of course, we would, our tower would coordinate, you know, with flights that operate in the corridor and stuff, but it's not even in our airspace. 
So as far as and our tenants are welcome to use, we have super, there's supersonic corridors there now that our tenants use, as well as military operating areas, restricted airspace already. And we don't we don't administer it, we don't regulate it, but our tenants use it. Does that make sense? So I appreciate that you know it being a national priority means it's going to occur one way or another. But would it necessarily occur here? Would it necessarily occur with our say? Um, we we I, don't. I, my point is, we don't have any jurisdiction over it. We're not. I, it doesn't. It's not obvious to me we have any influence whatsoever, other than being informed by being invited into the community to, you know, understand what changes it, what impact it will have to the airspace. There's being informed, and then there's also. I'm glad this is happening here and not Wichita. I'm glad this is happening here and not Georgia. If we well, we're away, talking about lobby efforts. Well, if we because lead, that's not how this stuff's decided. Well, if we lead the way in coordinating it, though, it it's we're ensured that it happens yeah. in our backyard. Are and we leading the way in coordinating, it? or is this being done? What's by Kimberly's plans? purpose in all this? What are they going to do for us with $42,000? Um, they are going to design the recommended uh, corridor. They're going to coordinate with the 2508 complex uh, to make sure that, that this is something that's feasible. So why is that something that Edwards, NASA, and the other interested parties, DOD, why aren't, why aren't they funding that? Because I imagine they don't have an interest like we do. I find that hard to believe because whoever our tenant is that's doing this, their customer is DOD. That doesn't make sense. One of the customers, though. There, there are others. I, I think, didn't we talk about this two meetings ago? Yes. Yeah. It, Not about this part, but we talked about Todd mentioned that he was attending meetings or participating but there's a big difference in that and hiring consultants to do something that we have no jurisdiction in. we don't we don't write the airspace regulations we don't we, we have no authority there. we have well there's a difference between power and influence we have no power but we can have influence this is our opportunity to know what we do. so maybe we can do is we can check my understanding from todd was that we were a participant in this i don't even think we were going to do that we were a participant in this, and Ms. Kimley, who is one of the district's retained engineers, uh, me and Hunt does civil, Kimley Horn does more aviation, and this, my understanding is we aren't even necessarily leading the charge, we're one of the participants. Yeah, it's a working group where they've invited everyone in the community so that there's no surprises, but that doesn't... I would assume that we'd just be having someone from the airport, you know, rep represent us. It would be control or something like I just don't understand what we're actually doing. So yeah, yeah I am concerned. Okay. And we can talk about it offline. Yeah, and, and I can get more information and have a better answer that question for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, another item that, that's, co that's coming up is that uh, we have put out a request for proposals um, looking for a qualified consulting uh, engineering firm to assist us with planning for um, uh, projects over, over a period of five years that will include uh, development of a, a commercial space master development plan, uh, possible uh, the feasibility design and construction of payload processing facility, which there, see, there appears to be a, a demand for that. Um, some some uh, um, future design for uh, uh, propellant storage facilities, uh, launch site operator operators licenses and evaluation, basically just a, a, um, a host of things that pertain to not only our existing license for, um, for launching, but also um, the future developing a, a game plan for us on the commercial uh, spaceport side of, of, of things. So that has that is out um, on uh, advertisement and the advertisement closes on the 25th. Um, property rented, just a review, we did loop logistics for 20 acres. Uh, I'm sorry, do you guys usually have any reviews? Are you pretty good? Typically not, it's just notifying that we it's yeah. listed for the board to have any questions. Okay. 
Um, finally, a recommended action item is uh, for the next meeting that we have. Uh, Kern County, uh, I'm sorry, Kern Economic Development Corp uh, does have a board seat available that they um, hold for the airport that was occupied by Bill Beavers, but obviously vacated by his retirement. Um, I think the recommendation is that uh, we, we uh, the board come to a, 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 a recommendation for that seat um, by the next meeting. If the candidates will be interested, or any of you, at the next meeting, we will have a bit of that person. I would like to do it with my situation. So, we said discussion on that the next meeting then. So we're going to talk about air traffic controller situation at all. Oh, we can update on that. Yeah, just just a quick update. Um, we we have um, we have hired uh, we put out offer memos and they've been accepted uh, for two full time air traffic controllers, one part time air traffic controller to fill in in the interim. Uh, that's already uh, been a previous air traffic controller for Mojave and another uh, potential part-timer to get to help limp us through until we can get the other two full-time up to speed and trained up. So uh, that's positive, I think, on the, on the air traffic control side. So I just wanted to show that with you guys real quick. Okay, so do we have any possible imminent dire concerns or are we covered barring anything uh, really uh, out there? I think that we'll be okay. I okay. think we'll be safe. Uh, any questions from other members of the board or any members of the public on that report? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we don't currently have any uh, standing board committees. Um, we did discuss the possibility of a subcommittee to communicate more detail uh, with considered power. Um, perhaps that's uh, a little premature. What does everybody think? Is that warranted now or do we wait on that? So what I think is we should probably bring Need and Hunt into conversation. And then there are new directors interested in this initial planning stage. I think probably makes sense. I don't know if this level of detail, you know, if you wanted in board meetings, that's fine, but I don't know if you're all interested in it until we get further down the road. Yeah. So I think, yeah, board members interested can involve themselves in those discussions, but as long as it's less than three of us, I mean, you know, as long as less than three of us are not interested, I don't really see a point in, um, in appointing a uh, subcommittee. That being said, obviously, Director Morgan, you're very passionate about this, so <laughs> keep them honest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all okay, well, I think that's a... Uh, that's all for the reports. Uh, so direct your comments on items not on the agenda. I already brought up what I wanted to know about uh, the air traffic controller. Anybody have anything else? Nope. Okay. Well, then I think that's, uh, yeah, we've got our closed session next. Right. So we'll move those in the, the meeting right now into a waiting room. And if you wanted to wait till the, when they go back into open, we'll move you back in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.